It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell the dis his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. All right, thank you, Judith, for reading. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. Why don't we pray and then, um, and then I'll speak for a little while. Our Father, we thank you for your word to us that's just been read and we thank you for the great truth that Christ is risen. Our Father, help us this morning to really understand what happened that first Easter. Help us to understand what happened and what that meant for Jesus. Help us to understand what happened and what that means for us. And our Father, help us to respond rightly to that great truth. And we pray it in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Well, friends, this term we've been working our way through Mark's account of Jesus. And the first half of the book recounts Jesus' incredible authority and power. His teaching, his miracles, healing diseases, calming a storm, walking on water, feeding thousands, things that cause thousands of people to follow him around and to ask themselves and each other, who is this man? Around the middle of the book, Jesus turns to his closest followers and says, what about you? Who do you say I am? Now they've heard and they've seen him doing what only God can do. And so they get it right, that he's God's son, the forever king. But they still didn't really grasp what it would mean for Jesus that first Easter or what it will mean for them. And so as we gather here um, this Easter Sunday... 2024, we're going to ask three important questions. What did happen that first Easter? Secondly, what did that mean? What did it mean for Jesus? And thirdly, what does it mean for us? Because you see, answers to those three questions are at the very heart of the Christian faith. And so firstly, what happened? What did happen? That first Easter, well, Jesus, the real historical Jesus I'm talking about, the one who taught publicly and proclaimed that he is God, who claimed to be God, the Jesus who performed many miracles, who backed up his claims with action, 
The Jesus who took on the religious leaders, who took them on and who exposed their hypocrisy. That first Easter, this Jesus, he was betrayed. He was falsely arrested and tried and he was killed. A large crowd of people, they saw him tortured, executed, taken down from a cross and pronounced dead. They saw him get wrapped in linen, buried in a tomb, and a massive stone was rolled across the entrance. Jesus' followers had been with him for three years. It had taken them you know, quite a while to understand who he is, but even longer to understand what he'd come to do, even though he told them again and again and again. And so Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 10, Jesus had told them that in Jerusalem he'd be killed, but that he'd rise to life. The Thursday night before he's killed, Jesus came, again told his followers in chapter 14 that he'd rise from the dead and that he'd meet up with them again in Galilee. On the Friday, we see in chapter 15 how Jesus was crucified, pronounced dead, and buried. And then Sunday, we see in chapter 16, some women at the tomb very early in the morning on the first day of the week. What did they see? Well, if you've got your Bibles open to, to Mark chapter uh, 16, you might want to follow along with me. I'm not putting anything on the screen today. I'm just going to ask that you either follow along in the Bible or that you just listen carefully to what I'm saying. And so look with me from Mark 16, verse, from verse 4. When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. They see an angel who declares, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now, over the next 40 days, Jesus' disciples and many others, they do see Jesus alive and well. They see him, they, they speak with him, they, they touch him, they eat with him. And then they go and they live radically transformed lives as they declare the truth of what they've witnessed and, 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 and many of them were even killed for declaring this truth. That Jesus was dead on the Friday and came alive on the Sunday. This great historical truth that Christianity is founded on. And so, and so that answers the, the what question, the what happened that first Easter. But it does lead to our obvious next questions, the, the so what questions. The so what questions. So what that some guy rose from the dead 2,000 years ago? So what? What does it mean, if anything, for Jesus and for us? Well, what does Jesus' resurrection mean for Jesus? It means some monumental things. And I'm going to explain a few of them. The first thing it means is that Jesus is, in fact, the Saviour, sent by God into this world to save us. You see, when Jesus spoke about his coming death, he spoke about giving his life as a ransom, as a ransom for many. In other words, giving his life as a payment to rescue other people. From what? From their sins. And, and where, was the, where was the drop point for this ransom payment? Well, it was at the cross. 
where Jesus, who never sinned, paid the price or penalty in full, where he bore the cost of God's judgment for everyone else's sin, for yours and for mine, if we trust in him. And what the resurrection shows, it shows that the resurrection shows that God accepted Jesus' payment, that the ransom was paid in full, that it was accepted and that it succeeded in purchasing my freedom, that my sins, my sins are now dealt with so that I can now be forgiven for every sin that I've ever committed, which is so, so, so many. The question for you is, have you come to the risen Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? Well, the second thing Jesus' resurrection means for Jesus is the fact that Jesus is, in fact, the Lord, the risen, ruling Lord and King of everyone and everything. That he's the one that God the Father had promised to send to conquer death and to rule over all. Here's how Jesus' earliest, earliest followers put it in the Bible. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. Now, I've got to say, I, I love that God has appointed Jesus Christ to be the ruler of the universe. I love that he hasn't appointed Joe Biden or, or, or Donald Trump or, or Vladimir Putin or, to rule forever. But that he has appointed Jesus, the sinless one, the crucified saviour, the risen ruler, the one whose commands are always good and loving and life-giving to all who trust and follow him. Let me ask, let me ask you, have you, you personally, submitted to Jesus as your ruler, as your leader? The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, the only way, the only way to have eternal life with Jesus in the age to come is to bow the knee to Jesus now in this world. Because, you see, it'll be too late if you don't bow the knee to him until after you've died. So Jesus' disciples, Christians that is, they trust him as their saviour now for the forgiveness of their sins. And they follow him and they learn from him as their ruler now so as to be more like him now. Because his resurrection means that Jesus is the saviour that he is the risen Lord and King. The third thing that Jesus' resurrection means for Jesus is that Jesus is also, in fact, the judge. That Jesus is the one who, one day, who will one day decide your eternity. Whether you'll spend eternity with God in heaven or away from God in hell. The Bible says that God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. That one day, you and I will stand before Jesus and Jesus will be our judge. Now, the fact that Jesus knows everything about me, that, you know, that makes it 
It's a pretty scary thought, right? Because he knows that I've sinned a lot. How's he going to decide my eternity? Whether I go to heaven or whether I go to hell? Well, don't forget that he's also the saviour. So, if in this world you've trusted him as your saviour and you've submitted to him as your Lord and King, then you don't need to fear him as your judge. If you haven't, though, if you haven't, then you really do need to fear him. Which naturally leads to our last question. What does Jesus' resurrection mean for us? Put simply, it means that our greatest enemy, death, has now been defeated. The Bible says that by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Jesus himself says about himself, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Jesus asks. Let me ask, how do you feel about your coming death? Is it something you worry about? Is it something you just try to avoid thinking about? Well, let me assure you of this. You can be sure about what happens after death. Why? Because Jesus died and came back to life never to die again. And all the evidence you need is right there. If you're, if you're simply willing to take a look. You know, when I became a Christian, I became a Christian at the age of 25. And when I was 25, I was a lawyer at the time. I was working as a lawyer and I was working mostly in the area of litigation. And so my job was to compile evidence, to build cases, to take into court. And so when I heard about Jesus, I was very, very interested in the evidence. And so I looked carefully at it. I looked carefully at it. I read books like, you know, is the, is the New Testament history evidence that demands a verdict more than a carpenter? Books like that. And what I found is that the New Testament is the best preserved and most historically reliable and accurate text in all of ancient history. By far, that there is nothing else like it in terms of evidence, and that the consensus, even among non-Christian experts who look into the historicity of the documents, is that the four Gospels about Jesus are reliable historical biographies. And you see, it's okay to be sceptical and ask questions. Even in the Bible, when the women who found the tomb empty on that first Easter Sunday morning, when they went... And when they told Jesus' disciples, even the disciples initially didn't believe it. But then, what did they do? What did they do? They went and checked it out. They went and they checked it out. And what did they find? The evidence. The evidence. They found the empty tomb. And in fact, they found the risen Lord Jesus himself who appeared to them. A number of times. There's, there's a book and also a film called The Case for Christ. And it's the true story about Lee Strobel, a legal editor at the Chicago Tribune, who sets out to use his journalism and his legal training to disprove the claims of Christianity. Once he'd come face to face with the evidence, though, with the evidence, he had no other valid option but to trust and follow Jesus. 
friends, follow the evidence. Face the facts. Because it's all there if you are willing to have a look. See, the historical truth of Jesus' resurrection, it's what, it's what we Christians, billions of us, stake our lives and our eternities on. That on the Friday, Jesus was dead and buried. But that on the Sunday, Jesus' heart began to beat again. Jesus' lungs began to breathe again. He opened his eyes, he sat up, he got up, and he busted out of the tomb. And in doing so, he busted open the barrier between us and God, the barrier of sin and death. And in doing so, he busted open the way to life beyond the grave for you and me. See, Jesus is risen. Jesus is alive. And he asks you and me, who do you say I am? Will you ignore him and stay forever condemned by your sin? Or will you look at the evidence See that Christ has risen. And so trust and follow Jesus.